Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, I think Sonia might be a little late uh, because she's on another panel. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, happy Father's Day to uh, those fathers that are joining. Um, and so I'm Joel Kira, uh, assistant professor at Georgia Tech and um, Kyle Zeng and Noel Kutela uh, have been sort of co-leading uh, the workshop, um, helping a lot with the organization. And then everyone else uh, on, on the organizing uh, committee also helped a lot um, with all the various logistics. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, the way this workshop was formed is, is kind of a combination of two prior workshops. Um, one is uh, learning from imperfect data, so Kyle uh, led this one uh, focusing on noisy data and weekly supervised learning. Um, and then uh, it's a combination of also VL3, which is another prior workshop that Rogerio Ferris and Noel Cudella and others uh, organized. Um, and that one focused more on uh, zero, few, or any shot learning, uh, domain adaptation, and long tail uh, classification. And so I think this, you know, these two topics were, were kind of combined and you know it really made a lot of sense to sort of focus on the holistic problem of uh, sort of how do you leverage kind of all sorts of different types of supervision, weak supervision, noisy supervision, and unlabeled data, uh, and then a, a few amount of labels. Um, and so because of this combination, some of the logistics, um, you know, we're trying some new things um, and we'll talk about that. Um, you know, largely this workshop will be uh, cool kind of Q&A panels, whereas the, the videos and the presentations are available on YouTube, as I'll talk about. So in terms of uh, papers, we had um, 78 submissions, which I think is more than uh, what we've had in the past. Um, so we had to uh, find lots of reviewers for this. Um, there were 34 accepted papers um, out of that, and then I guess very similar to uh, CVPR type uh, acceptance rate, there were about 12 out of the 34 accepted uh, selected as oral. Um, and so those will be, um, you know, uh, participating in the, in the workshop, they'll have spotlight talks and also participate in the panels as well. So uh, yeah, I'm just gonna scroll through the list of papers, but it's on the website uh, and where there are archive papers, we've linked them as well. So you can check those out. Uh, and this is the list of uh, the oral papers. Um, there were uh, some challenges as part of the uh, workshop. Um, uh, one was sort of a classification challenge and the other a localization challenge. Uh, I'm showing here just one snippet of results, um, but. Kyle will essentially talk about these challenge results uh, when we talk about them in the spotlight session uh, at the end. So the last spotlight session will focus on this, these challenges um, and the results and um, some of the uh, winners will present their work as well. So the, as you probably know, um, this is all linked on our webpage, um, but the we have a YouTube channel and this is where all the uh, cool talks are, um, about 20 minutes each. Um, and, you know, we have playlists, uh, both for the oral and the poster uh, papers, as well as um, the invited speakers. And so the, you know, those are listed here. We've already gotten, actually, this is just as of yesterday, 1300 uh, views, but I think it sounded like it was exponentially increasing uh, the closer we got to the workshop. Uh, so, you know, I think this is uh, really great. We have, we have a lot of great viewership uh, and, and some questions as well. Um, so this is the overall agenda that we'll have. Um, so essentially we'll have several things. Uh, we'll have invited talks slash or speakers slash panel topics. Um, so we're not gonna be showing the YouTube videos. You can hopefully have watched them. Uh, if not, you can watch them during the breaks, um, but essentially we'll take questions uh, for the speakers grouped into topics. So the first topic is unlabeled data, uh, self and semi-supervised learning and domain adaptation. Uh, so there we have four of uh, four great speakers uh, that will be answering your questions. We'll take questions from the YouTube comments. Um, if there are any, there are, we, I've already seen some, 
for a lot of these speakers. And then we'll also take any live questions. And you can put the live questions into the chat forum and I'll read them out. Um, and then each topic also has some orals associated with them uh, just based on the topic. And those will kind of ask them to um, you know, ask questions or, or provide any additional comments that they want based on the discussion. Um, and then we'll also have paper spotlight talks where we, the oral uh, papers will present as well as some of the challenge participants. Um, so, you know, essentially that's the whole workshop consisting of these uh, panels and the spotlight talks. We'll have a coffee break uh, in between. And then while well, during the lunch break at noon uh, Pacific time and, and uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, we'll have a Gatherly poster session, um, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. Um, but the Gatherly is only used for the poster session. So um, there, there are instructions. And by the way, all these slides are up uh, on our website as well. Um, there are instructions here um, on how to access Gatherly. It's directly from the platform. You just go to our workshop, click on the link, the Gatherly link. I don't know that it's the most intuitive interface. I tried it this morning. Um, you essentially can click on these ele the elevator and that can directly take, you can click on um, the, the different uh, rooms. So there, ours is split into two poster rooms and then people will stand by their little poster icon there and share their screen. And you can kind of double click on that location and you'll see them and be able to talk to them and they'll share their screen with their poster as well. Um, so again, this is kind of what the room looks like. Just double click on where you wanna go you can double click on the elevator to get to this and then you can, it'll show the L2ID posters. It's split into two rooms and then you can just double click on the poster location and then you should be able to see. Um, you can only share a screen, I think, around when you have people around. So um, that little icon over there um, it, it, that's highlighted is where you click for, for the poster presenters to share their screen uh, once they show their posters. Um, so again, this is the format. The panel sessions will have five minutes of intro, 30 minutes of, of questions roughly, and then um, we'll ask the orals for questions as well or, or comments. And then um, we'll have paper spotlight talks and the gatherly poster session. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, this is a really cool topic. Uh, there's a ton of interest in this area um, and a lot of progress being made in, even in the past you know, few months. Um, so, you know, there's constant evolution in this area. So it's really exciting. Um, and I don't know if the other organizers wanted to add anything, um, but if not, I can also take any questions that people may have on the logistics. Anything you want to add, Kyle or Noel? No? Okay. I think you've summed it up pretty well. Thanks. Okay, cool. Sounds good. So, um, I will stop sharing my screen and we can go ahead and start with the first uh, panel. Um, and so essentially we'll start with a quick introduction um, and I'll just call out the names. Um, so Will Yang, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm happy to be invited to uh, this workshop and uh, uh, I'm currently a postdoc uh, at uh, the University of Texas Austin. I uh, achieved my PhD degree from the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, and uh, my interest, uh, my research interest lie in uh, thermal adaptation, uh, regular, regularized deep neural network training, as well as learning, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, Thank Angela? You. Hi, I'm Angela. I'm an assistant professor at the Technical University of Munich um, and looking into how to create uh, reconstructions and semantic understanding of real world environments from commodity sensors. Uh, and then Colin. Hi, my name is Colin Raffle. I'm an assistant professor at uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I also will work one day a week at Hugging Face and for the past few years have mostly been focused on methods for learning from limited label data, including semi-supervised learning, transfer learning, unsupervised learning, et cetera. Okay, awesome. And then I think I mentioned, uh, I don't think Sonia is on yet. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, 
and see where it goes. I will say, so this is a new, relatively new format uh, for, for workshops. So um, it requires interaction. So please do um, ask lots of questions in the chat. Um, and these can be, of course, based on the talks, but also, you know, uh, anything roughly related to these topics. Um, so I'm gonna, I guess, uh, start with um, some of the questions that we got on YouTube. Uh, let me see, actually, oh, sorry, I'll start with uh, some of a different question. Um, so I guess, Colin, um, I'll start with you and then we can kind of generalize it to the rest of the panel. Um, so one, one thing that you mentioned, I guess, uh, emphasized in your talk is semi-supervised learning within distribution data where the unlabeled and the labeled data is it comes from the same distribution. Um, so I guess one question is, you know, when we're dealing with unlabeled data, um, how do we deal with out of distribution data, which, you know, in the real world, if you're kind of crawling a large set of unlabeled data, how might you deal with that? <clears throat> or if you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So just to maybe get things started, uh, I've started to become a little bit of a stickler for uh, terminology. And the way, because, uh, you know, a lot of these methods in semi-supervised learning, transfer learning, et cetera, start to look pretty similar. To me, semi-supervised learning is specifically the setting where the unlabeled data is drawn from the same distribution as the labeled data. So there is no domain mismatch at all. And as soon as there's domain mismatch, you're not doing semi-supervised learning anymore. You're doing transfer learning. That's just what I've decided my convention is. People can feel free to disagree with that or not. Uh, of course, transfer learning is an incredibly useful suite of techniques. And in particular, you know, as I'm sure most people here know, recently there's been a lot of huge progress in uh, visual representation learning for vision in the transfer learning case. Um, and the, the, I, I do think that there's kind of an open question, which basically is what happens when your unlabeled data is not, let's say like, well-cropped single object data, uh, which is often the case in the unlabeled data that people use to evaluate self-supervised representation learning techniques. And I feel that there's some initial evidence that some of these sort of contrastive learning ideas or these ideas that rely on uh, data augmentation and certain assumptions about if I do this to my image, then I, I should result in a similar representation. These assumptions sort of start to fall apart when you just have completely random images off the internet. Uh, and so to me, one promising direction to think about, well, I guess I'll identify two. One is to think about different augmentation techniques that don't rely on these assumptions so strongly. Like for example, doing this, instead of doing, you know, assume that two crops result in the same object, for example. Um, and then the other piece is to consider things like uh, hard negative and easy positive mining <laughs> because uh, you know you basically end up with these false positives and false negatives uh, when you use data augmentation with like really really diverse data. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I guess you know I think this is relevant to some of the other uh, panelists as well. Um, so I know Angela, you know, uh, the RGBD kind of work you presented you know, uh, can have you know for example you can have um, different types of 3D sources, right? Uh, Connect or LiDAR or other things. So you might have different varying distributions. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we have lots of these challenges, especially in the 3D domain with regards to not only different sensor data, but we also typically have a strong focus on a very limited set of class categories where there's like a huge long tail that is not really being considered at, at the moment. So there's a lot of interesting questions about how to best handle these challenges. I'm not sure what the exact right answer is. Um, I mean, maybe in a more general sense, though, I think there might be some promise towards learning representations and, and this for 2D, 3D that um, are actually grounded in characteristics from both domains. You, maybe you can get by with learning things like view invariance um, by having explicit notions of geometry or spatial correspondence, um, perhaps even with dynamic correspondence to be able to learn some sort of more low level fundamental characteristics of what might be um, you know, descriptive of objects in, in a more general sense um, that 
we've typically found that these kinds of lower level reconstruction tasks are really helpful in terms of representation learning for higher level semantics. So maybe this can also be extended further along this line. And then, uh, yeah, I know Guolin and um, like some of the domain adaptation obviously directly kind of try to map one distribution to the other, or at least align the features. Um, how do you yeah. see that, I guess, playing a role in, in the use of unlabeled data? Uh, sorry, can I repeat your, your question? So, I mean, so, you, you know, you presented some of the uh, semantic segmentation and domain adaptation, right, where you're trying to yeah, directly yeah. align the distributions, right, of features. Yeah. Um, so, I guess, how do you see that play a role in, in, in like leveraging unlabeled data? Can we, um, can, if we have many different distributions of unlabeled data, can we maybe try to use domain adaptation methods to try to align some distrib the distributions or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in my talk, I'm going uh, discuss uh, about the single domain adaptation where we uh, only have a single source. Uh, uh, data, but in practice, we may have uh, uh, multi source domain data. They are uh, from different distributions. And uh, yeah, if we have uh, multi source domain data, I think we can further uh, improve the adaptation performance on our target domain. Yeah. A question is how to uh, mitigate the discrepancy across different source domains. I right. think. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess the multi-source kind of problems are, are just now being start, you know, worked on. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, that was great. Um, so I guess uh, I, I should mention. Um, so uh, Zhao Xuan is also a co-host, co co-moderator. Co um, so if he has a question that he wants to ask. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would like to ask Angela a question. That, uh, that uh, I, I watch your talk, it's very amazing. And uh, I would like to know, could you give us some intuition that uh, why we can use the incomplete, incomplete data alone to, to get a very amazing result, a very complete 3D reconstruction. Could you give us some uh, intuitions? Uh, I, I think uh, uh, in your talk, the major uh, technique that you use is to uh, use more incomplete data to train. Uh, so I, I would like to know if we cannot uh, access the uh, original 3D thing, how can the model naturally learn to complete such amazing results? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so typically when we're scanning and observing these kinds of, of 3D scenes, um, you end up with these missing regions. But the, the nice thing about this reconstruction process is that you know the regions which you have not actually observed. So, so you know where things have, are, are incomplete and unobserved. Um, and that's fundamentally important to basically um, throw out supervision for. So we don't want to learn from any of these regions where we don't actually know whether there is actually surface geometry or empty space. Um, and so what we rely on in this case actually is that there is a diversity of views across the entire training set. So every individual scene um, that has been scanned and observed and is incomplete in the train set, nonetheless, typically has a, a different kind of set of um, view observations. So in some scenes, chairs are seen from the front and some chairs are seen from the back or, or the side. Um, and so that allows you to learn a diverse uh, sort of um, geometric patterns across uh, the training set because you, you do actually see a full chair um, perhaps across the whole training data set, even if you might not actually see one full complete chair in one single example. So because we, we know where exactly we know there is geometry and um, we, it can ignore regions where we don't actually know what the answer is, um, we can generate this more incomplete data such as to learn these kinds of diverse patterns. And, and that um, view diversity is what actually allows us to generate reconstructions that can actually be more complete than a, a single observation in the train set, but it's the diversity of, of the train set scenes and the different um, sort of view characteristics that allow us to learn these generalization patterns. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, while we're in the topic of um, 3D, there's a question um, asking about, and it's a little ambiguous, but uh, asking, I guess, for Angela, um, how shall we learn the geometry of scenes beyond the physical reach of 3D scanners? Um, so I guess maybe they're referring to things that are occluded, like self-occlusion or uh, other, like, I guess, properties of 3D things that we may not be able to get from traditional scanners. I mean, that's definitely a relevant question considering I think most people still are, are using um, only uh, RGB sensing modalities on, on their, their phones. Um, and, and we don't have so many commodity sensors for, for range sensing. So of course, um, I think a, a natural thing is to apply any kind of um, multi-view constraints that can be acquired. So that's in some sense easier to get if you can define the task yourself, um, because whenever you can take a, a single image, you can usually acquire at least a, a few hoop shots of uh, frames for a video sequence. And they might be um, small and baseline, but they can give you uh, still a good estimate um, of uh, depth just by these kinds of, of stereo matching techniques. So that is definitely a strong sing signal that can be leveraged in this scenario. There might be um, other interesting approaches that take maybe more like a, an object centric um, approach to say, well, uh, I mean, we know general structures of different kind of objects that can be recognized even if they're far away, um, partially occluded, and use uh, prior knowledge of um, these shapes, 3D models, that we now have lots of these available um, in order to estimate uh, at least a, a guess of the geometry in, in these regions. Uh, Zhao Shuan, do you want to have another question? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's great. And I think uh, there are the questions for Colin. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, one, one audience asked uh, that the unlabeled data is abundantly available. Uh, however, it can't be used in ID manner due to the size. Uh, how can we possibly adapt the model toward the streaming data, that the data comes in continuously. Could you share, share more information to this side? Yeah, absolutely. So I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it sort of seems like you're asking if, if, uh, if we're dealing with streaming data or doing this online, then it might be that the distribution of the unlabeled data is changing over time uh, because yeah, you know, yeah. different things happen in the world over time. and I mean, I guess I, I, this isn't a setting that I've studied. My, I would actually have somewhat optimistic, um, I'd be somewhat optimistic that existing techniques could work reasonably well here, kind of for the reason that actually neural networks are prone to forgetting uh, the past. Uh, the, you know, this issue called catastrophic forgetting that people typically talk about in continual learning settings that people are typically trying to mitigate because, you know, you don't want the neural network to forget the, uh, things and tasks that it's learned in the past. Um, so to me, like I said, I would be optimistic that the naive thing of continually training the model on the, on the new unlabeled data as it continues to come in would actually be a pretty good place to start. Um, most of the work that I'm aware of in continual learning, like I said, is trying to prevent or mitigate cat catastrophic forgetting. I'm less aware of methods that try to encourage it. Um, and uh, I don't know if, if other panelists have, have any experience with this or um, if anyone wants to share any work there, but I, I think that would, that would be an interesting, um, interesting direction too. Yep. Um, can you, I guess just as a follow-up, I think one, another aspect is just the streaming aspect where for, for a lot of the self-training and, and contrastive learning kind of methods require typically pretty large batches and also, I mean, you know, a lot of training. So kind of training them in a streaming fashion online is, is I don't know if it's, you know, if you have any comments on how, how that might be possible or if there are works that have looked at such problems. Yeah, I'm not, like I said, I, I'm not actually aware of, uh, of papers that have, have worried about this. I, I do know there has been some work on 
making these contrastive learning techniques less reliant on large batches. Right. Um, and, and it's also worth mentioning that if, if the real issue is that uh, you, know, you, you can't get around large patches in the contrastive case. There are pretty good representation learning approaches, you know, outside of um, uh, outside of contrastive representation learning, um, and uh, it might that might be a good avenue to explore. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay. So there's another question, and by the way, thanks for keeping the questions coming um, to uh, Guo Liang. Uh, so this is about domain adaptation. Yeah. Um, so distribution alignment has been the way to go for domain adaptation for a long time now. Uh, do you think it really is the ultimate solution to domain adaptation problem, or is there any other paradigm worth investigating? Uh, yeah. Uh, in my opinion, uh, performing distribution alignment is an effective way to uh, deal with the domain adaptation problem, but a, it may not be the only way to deal with this. Uh, issue. Uh, one direction I think we should uh, pay more attention to is um, when we perform uh, the distribution alignment, we should also take the downstream task into consideration. Uh, that is, um, uh, besides minimizing the discrepancy across the months, we should also uh, try to improve the discriminate uh, of the features on the target domain. Uh, for example, uh, try to uh, perform the class wear alignment to enlarge the margin between classes on the target. Yeah. Uh, another direction I think is um, currently uh, uh, we test our domain adaptation techniques on uh, standard benchmarks. For these ben benchmarks, we have uh, the fixed uh, source DOM data and uh, fixed uh, target DOM data. So um, there may be some variation missing in the source, but the effective for the target domain. But uh, performing uh, the distribution alignment may uh, weak, may weaken this uh, the the uh, effective part for the target domain. Uh, so uh, and the limit the adaptation performance on the target. So uh, in future, I think um, it is also worth investigating how to uh, fill the missing uh, variations in the source, but uh, uh, be, uh, should be, but be beneficial for the target performance. I think uh, it is a direction that worth investigating. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Sean, do you want to? Ask a question. Regarding this uh, alignment issue, do you have any suggestions that uh, how can we uh, how can we preserve the semantic uh, that is also the discriminatory of, of the model, but also align the distribution? I think it's uh, why it's quite challenging you know, as uh, as if we want to uh, align the distribution, we may not uh, consider the. Uh, Semantic preserving capability. So, do you have any suggestions for this? Uh, uh, actually, in our previous work, we have made some uh, attempts. Uh, one way is to perform the class aware alignment. Uh, that is, we should take the uh, class information into the uh, dis distribution alignment process because uh, the conventional distribution alignment uh, didn't take the class information into consideration. So uh, two distributions uh, which are similar uh, on the whole, but may, uh, may be different, uh, but may, may be not well aligned uh, uh, for uh, each class. So uh, this is one way to improve the discriminative ability of the uh, features uh, during the feature alignment. Uh, yeah, another way is uh, in uh, in uh, the the talk I uh, of this workshop. I in the for the semantic semantician, we uh, try to build the pixel level associations. Uh, we uh, measure the uh, pixel wise similarities and uh, try to 
minimize such uh, discrepancy between uh, pixel pairs rather than uh, following the conventional uh, way uh, using adversarial training to uh, align the feature maps uh, on the whole view. So uh, yeah, this is our previous uh, effective uh, attempts. Yeah, I think uh, there are maybe more effective ways to deal with the problem and uh, Okay, great. Uh, I see Sonia uh, joined. So uh, do you want to introduce yourself and we, we can ask you a question? Thank you. Sure, I'm really sorry. I had to be in a mentoring session. Hey, I'm Sonia. I'm an associate professor at the University of Toronto and I also lead um, a research lab at NVIDIA. And you know, my background is computer vision and these days a lot around 3D deep learning. Okay, great. Um, so we do have uh, so, some questions. Um, I believe, uh, let's see. So, so there's one question about um, a lot of works have been using uh, game engines or, you know, obviously, um, you know, a lot of the um, like Un Unreal and other engines uh, as well as real, you know, Xbox and other games to gather data. So how would you, I guess, contrast that or, or compare with like the GAN based approach for generating data? Yeah, so there's some fundamental differences between the rest. So a game engine, there needs to be an artist in the loop, right, which creates all that content. And then, you know, there is a scripting or the behavior scripting how the worlds look like, and then there's the rendering process. So you have infinite control about the environment you're going to generate, but there's either a lot of work plus there, even with a lot of work, there's still probably going to be some gap, both in content and in the rendering, even if this rendering is you know, amazingly photorealistic. Uh, GANs allow you to learn directly from real data, right? Which means that you are training your generative model to mimic that real data. Now, obviously, you know, these generative models are not perfect yet, so they're dropping modes and so on. But in principle, just you know, design choices to actually have them you know, mimic real data. On the other hand, they can only mimic data you have seen, right? So in a game engine, if I want to create an accident on the road, I can do that. I can script that behavior, and there's going to be an accident. Um, if I'm, you know, if I have never recorded an accident, then all these generative models that I have are not going to be able to to kind of synthesize it. So I think there is benefits on either side and really probably the future is somehow combining them. Um, that's my opinion. Okay, great. Um, I guess one follow-up is, um, uh, you know, you had a great talk uh, on, on your presentation. And um, one thing I was kind of surprised about is how it was really effective at the very low label, you know, in order to generalize across views, for example, where you labeled very densely a very small number of things, and then it was able to generalize. Do you have an intuition of why it was able to perform so well um, with so few labels? Yeah, in fact, like we started that project with intuition. It was all wishful thinking, right? So we were just, uh, you know, the, the first version of that project was what, just inspecting GANs and how they can generate all these different viewpoints. And, you know, if you take let's say two different latent codes of two different cars or different viewpoints, then it was able to interpolate in between, right? So really kind of our intuition was that inside that, that GAN, those features are somehow learning something about the correspondences, both across viewpoints and across different objects, right? And in order to do this labeling or propagate these labels from you know, one example to another, you essentially need to know those correspondences. Right, so our hope would be that if these GANs already have these properties, then maybe just attaching like a tiny little MLP on top of those, you know, feature maps would kind of just work, right? And so that was really just kind of coming out from intuition, but, you know, we were still surprised just how well that actually worked. I, I was shocked, you know, with a single example, the performance was just, uh, in my opinion, incredible. Um, so, you know, I'm really kind of excited about this um, generative uh, objectives, right? Whether it's a full image generation or in painting, but it feels like a really good 
way to learn representations that you know internally build some sort of semantics. Um, Okay. Now, granted, at the time, there was no pixel-wise contrastive loss approaches, so I cannot claim that you cannot do the same with those kind of line of work, no. uh, but we were just super cool if people try it. I think we are releasing data in, in a day or two. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, Zaroshwan, you, you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, uh, the question is also for Sanya. Um, so uh, we will use the uh, GAN to generate generate the data set. Uh, when we generalize the model, train the uh, data set created by GAN, do, do, do you have any observation that the model have the tendency to still suffer from like uh, uh, domain gaps? For example, if we have the real world data, that, uh, how generalizable is the model trained on the GAN created data set? Data set? Yeah, so I mean, gen GAN generated data sets are going to be synthetic in a sense that they're generated by GANs, but they are trained to mimic real data, right? Now, obviously, it's not perfectly true, so they're going to have some artifacts. In fact, in some sampled images, it doesn't even look like the object, right? It's kind of weird. Um, and, you know, if you're now training these models, this like feed forward models on that data, maybe maybe something bad can happen. In, in the results, we do actually test on real data. So all the results in the tables and plots are tested on ADE data set, which is essentially a real data set, which our models have not even seen. So all of our deep lab architectures have only seen uh, data set generated from the, the data set GAN. While we, the baseline, which was an, the same architecture, deep lab was trained on ADE training set. And we, we basically match them in with like 16 or 19 examples. So there is evidence. I cannot claim that this can just generally work, but in our experiments, there is evidence that this method can actually uh, do really well on real world data. Um, in fact, like we have, a, we have two different ideas here. So I talk about a data set again in the workshop. Um, we have another paper at CVPR, which is a similar idea, but a different method, uh, tackling a little bit of a different setup. Um, so in data set GAN, we had to label a basically GAN generated images so that you had a latent code and you can just train supervised loss, right? An obvious question would be, every time I retrain again, I need to go and relabel this data. So how can I make these methods actually use some already labeled training set? So this other GAN approach uh, was basically a little bit different and uh, was trying to leverage already labeled data to train the same kind of like, you know, image plus label generator. And we also use that same GAN to label images at test time. Uh, you, you should check it out, it's called semantic GAN. And the, the properties of this method are, are astonishing. So it's actually really, really good on uh, out of the main generalization, meaning you train it on whatever celeb A or whatever data set we used, and you can go to met faces, which is paintings and sculptures, which are really different. And we, we beat basically everyone by, by a large chunk, which means that not only it transfers well to real world data, it also transfer really well to very different domains of real data. Um, and I don't, I don't have precise theoretical arguments why this happened, but the empirical observation is, is, is works really well. Um. Great. Um, there's a, a question on the chat. Uh, I guess this is for Angela, but um, I think others might be able to answer as well. Um, so um, the question is, what are the best practices and useful techniques for domain adaptation in the following scenario? Um, if we're training from 3D single objects, like a mechanical component and generating, I guess, images around the object, but then we wanna test uh, with real pictures taken by the users. Mm -hmm. So that, that sounds like the, the synth real kind of scenario, maybe game engines versus um, real data. So, I mean, here, I'm not uh, the, expert in the domain adaptation techniques, but I think it seems that um, this kind of uh, distribution alignment with adversarial losses tends to work 
um, reasonably well um, in, in the standard kind of uh, problem setup where you don't actually have any correspondence. We do have some small data sets um, that now have like synthetic CAD models actually associated with real imagery or real RGBD um, data, which uh, might help in terms of also jumpstarting the optimization that you can have fairly close to one-to-one -one correspondences to, to bring these distributions actually together um, for several different object category uh, scenarios. So that's also potentially interesting um, in terms of bringing these domains together. Okay. I don't know if anyone else wanted to, in the panel wanted to chime in on that one. Okay. Maybe I can take a stab at it. Sure. Um, so, so there's a lot of techniques that are trying to do this seam to real transfer. I think the domain adversarial training is probably the state of the art, where basically you have one label domain, let's say synthetic data, and then some real domain, and then you're trying to fool your feature learner to basically not, not be able to distinguish the two domains. Um, now, now that said, typically there is still a gap. I haven't seen a method that would completely close the gap between synthetic and real data. I, I don't know exactly why it could be due to the rendering not being perfectly realistic or the content or the way we're kind of creating the context of these objects in scenarios. Um, but what was really surprising to me recently is we, we took this clip clip model that was trained on, I don't know how many millions of images online. So it has seen all sorts of data. And if you take that model and you apply it to synthetic data or real data, it works really well. So maybe that's the answer. Right? Maybe maybe we need to learn these feature learners just across tons of domains and not just like overfit to one specific domain. Okay. Um, Shawn, do you, do you want to ask a question as well? Or? Uh, Carnival. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I have uh, I have a question for for Colin. That is for uh, that is for learning. Uh, I think currently semi learning is, uh, is uh, works work very well with the uh, advancements in recent years. So do you foresee some more, um, challenges and uh, opportunities that uh, we, we can we can have to further push forward this area, uh, especially uh, whether we can um, apply the techniques uh, developed in classification to more large scale problems like uh, object detection, semantic segmentation. So we would like to learn more about your, your thinking. Could you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So to me, the most of the really exciting advances in semi supervised learning over the past few years, in my opinion, have either been thanks to consistency regularization, which relies on pretty strong assumptions about using useful data augmentation. And honestly, a lot of those advances have come from basically advances in better data augmentation. So either consistency regularization or self-training. And self-training is 50, 60, 70 years old. It's a very old and very simple method. And it, it just turns out to be hard to beat. In my experience, using consistency regularization or using these really wild uh, data augmentation techniques that people use becomes less useful when you're not doing like single object classification, uh, when you're doing these, you know, harder and more interesting problems. And in those settings, that's where self-training tends to seem be, be pretty powerful. And to, to me, self-training is kind of the simplest thing you can do. And if the thing that seems to work best is the simplest thing, that's really exciting, but that's often not the case. There's, there's probably other things we can do to be clever um, other than just like using our model to, to label data. Um, that's part of what I was getting at in my talk a little bit was trying to dig in a little deeper and say, you know, self-training sometimes works really well. Why is that? And like I said in my talk, I think a lot of it comes down to applying self-training along with really sophisticated and smart regularization. So, you know, to me, you know, if I'm to continue that narrative from my talk, I would say that thinking through what appropriate regularization is, also connecting self-training to ideas from model calibration, because obviously uh, if, you're, if you're using this heuristic where you only keep a label if it's high confidence, that only works when the model is well calibrated. 
Um, so yeah, thinking through the connections to regularization and, uh, and calibration probably will push self-training forward uh, even more. Okay, great. Um, and I guess we have time, there's one more question. Um, so this is, I guess, to anyone who wants to take it. Um, so for problems of scene reconstruction, are there notions of domain complexity for integrating large unlabeled data? For example, indoor versus outdoor, overhead versus side view, number of pixels on object. In other words, how can we characterize the scope of unlabeled problems to determine if we have enough data to support these methods? It's a bit of a mouthful and, and, and complex maybe, but uh, anyone wanna take it on? This is on the chat, by the way, as well. So I guess, yeah, if we just, you know, I, I, you, you can have, you know, unlabeled data of many kinds, right? Um, satellite imagery to self-driving to indoor. Um, can we somehow characterize these, these this unlabeled data and how much we need and what type we need? I can I can try to stick a stab at it. Um, just just in light of our work that we have been pursuing with this uh, in again based approaches as representation learners. Um, so we had a lot of success on uh, on this like single object where the object is roughly centered, where the GANs are really able to capture that distribution. And lately we've been trying to scale it up to like full driving scenes, um, and that comes with so many difficulties. Like we are, I think um making progress but it's just such a tough problem so um we are presenting drive again here at cvpr and i was trained i think on 100 hours of unlabeled data and you can still see obvious artifacts in those generations and as a result 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 of generative model not being so good and the semantics we're trying to attach to those layers is also not as good so i don't have an answer of how much you know unlabeled data you have but the more complex the scenes are, the more scenarios there are, and a lot of them are in the long tail, which you know all these representations tend to ignore, um, and it just becomes harder and harder. Um, so I don't, I don't have a good answer, but you know there's definitely I think all these little contrastive approaches which do it at the image scale. Um, I, I think there's just going to be a new, new way of there needs to be a new way of doing that on these really complicated scenes. Yeah, I think this gets back a little bit to what we were discussing earlier about how contrastive learning techniques are mostly applied to like basically single object images where you can make really strong assumptions about what data augmentation is. And it's interesting and kind of depressing to hear that GAN based approaches also <laughs> don't work so well in these like very, very complex scenes. Um, so, but I guess I, if I were to, you know, try to start a research project to push this forward in the very short term. Uh, yeah, I, I think thinking about, you know, smarter positive and negative mining for contrastive learning, um, basically trying to avoid the situation where you're training the model on lots of false positives or false negatives. Um, I don't know that that would be a fundamental breakthrough, but that might get us a little further. Okay, great. Anyone want to have a, any, any of the other panelists? Um, quick last minute comment on that. I think that's a big question right. as to uh, well, how much, how to determine whether we have enough data is, is an interesting question. Um, and I don't think I have a good answer for that necessarily, but I think we also haven't fully exhausted. Um, I mean, this is maybe some small portion of this question. We haven't really fully exhausted all the, the capability of the data sets that we have in 3D. Um, even with the, the labeled data that we actually have available because nobody's really looking at the long tail of the, the labeled data sets there. So that even that is an interesting place to start. Um, what is interesting is that you do seem to require maybe less, maybe because these data sets are somewhat redundant and repetitive in and of themselves, we don't necessarily require so much data for more um, lower level tasks like recon geometric reconstruction um, that, um, can be trained on just like, you know, a thousand scenes or something like this. But maybe this also has to do with the fact that um, certain representations are, are a bit more unified in, in 3D. We don't have to learn across view invariance and, and the like. Okay, great. Um, so th there's more questions pouring in, but unfortunately we're out of time. Um, that, that was a great discussion. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, thank you to all the panelists and speakers. Um, that was great. And then, um, 
We'll move to uh, the spotlight talks now. And then after that, we'll have the second panel on few shot learning as well. Cool, thank you again. And let me share my screen. Okay, uh, you should be able to see my screen. So uh, is Edgar here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. Take it off. Hello everybody, I'm Edgar Bernal with the Rochester Data Science Consortium at the University of Rochester. And I'll be presenting the results of my work on training deep generative models with incomplete data. Next slide, please. Uh, the work deals with the task of data imputation, which consists in filling in missing values from partially observed data. Existing approaches model the complex statistical relationships between observed data entries and use the resulting statistical models to fill in the missing values. Our approach is no exception. We leverage normalizing flow models for reasons that will become apparent later on. Next slide. We focus on the task of imputation for scenarios of high data paucity. This plot shows how the performance of state-of-the-art methods decays as the rate of data missingness increases it can be seen that the performance decreases significantly in regimes of high data paucity. Next slide. In order to perform statistical modeling of the observed data samples, our approach leverages normalizing flow models, a family of generative models which are tractable and explicitly learn the data distribution. We exploit three attributes of these models. The first one is latent variable inference, which refers to being able to compute the embedding representation of a given sample. Next slide. Oh, I think you skipped one. Yeah. Uh, log likelihood evaluation refers to being able to compute the log likelihood of a given sample once a model has been exposed to a training set. Intuitively, the log likelihood of a sample indicates how likely it is for that sample to occur given the learned population statistics of the training set. Next slide. Normalizing flow models are, are also invertible and allow unique sample reconstruction from an embedding representation. The next slide shows how we would use uh, a a pre-trained normalizing flow model for data imputation. If we had a normalizing flow model trained on the data of interest, we could, in theory, use it to perform imputation by choosing pixel values at missing entries that maximize the likelihood of the reconstructed sample conditioned on the observed values. Next slide. Unfortunately, in imputation tasks of interest, the training data itself is incomplete. Consequently, construction of a flow model is not feasible. This is because we need complete data to train a model. And as we saw in the previous slide, we need a model to impute missing data. This is a causality dilemma. Next slide. We address this causality dilemma by alternately updating the model with the imputed data and improving the quality of the imputed data with the updated model. So if you click a couple of times, you'll see how the model, uh, so next slide the model uh, updates, then the data gets updated, and we repeat this uh, iterative process until we reach um, convergence. Next slide. Yeah, we do it a couple of times. Yep, and we do it uh, until uh, convergence is, is achieved. Uh, traditionally, uh, um, training a normalizing flow model, oh, sorry, involves choosing model parameters that maximize the log likelihood of the, of the observed data. We denote these parameters as theta in this light and the forward and inverse transformation affected by the model as G and G inverse respectively. Since this is a purely data-driven approach, the quality of the resulting normalizing flow model may be lacking, particularly in high data missing scenarios. We instead optimize a two-term objective that incorporates a regularizing term which enforces our prior knowledge of the data. We denote this framework as PR flow for prior regular, regularized normalizing flow. And in this work, we enforce a hyper Laplacian prior, but you can enforce any prior of your choice. On the next slide, 
I'll show you a few results and this is more of a challenge for you guys. These are uh, numbers that are only 10% visible where only 10% of the, of the pixels are visible. Can you guess what the numbers are? Next slide shows the, the answers. And you can see that PR flow produces the more realistic reconstructions. Uh, that is the images that are more number-like and that it tends to recover the original semantic information encoded in the partially observed image. Uh, it's also very good at recovering original images without, oh, with the smallest uh, mean squared error. Next slide shows a similar example for faces. Can you make out the gender of the face uh, of the person in the picture or any, um, or their hair color or whether they are wearing any accessories? Next slide shows the results with the ground truth on the left. Um, and once again, these results qualitatively show that PR flow produces the most uh, realistic losing, uh, looking faces. Um, and just to, uh, to point out that these models have never been exposed to a full, uh, fully visible number or face. And so that they have to infer what, the, what a number or a face looks like from the fractional observations they have access to at training. So, so that assessment makes these results all the more impressive. The ne next slide, I show a few uh, quantitative results on three different metrics of interest. Um, Left-hand side shows pixel level performance, that is how accurately we are recovering the, the intended pixel level values. On the um, mid plot, we show population level performance, that is um, how close the, stati the statistics of the reconstructed images match the, the, statistic the statistics of the ground truth, and we measure that with the Frechet in 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 inception distance. And on the right-hand side, we show um, the semantic level performance, which we measure in the form of classification accuracy on the reconstructed images of a classifier trained on fully visible images. We can see that PR flow outperforms uh, state-of-the-art methods across all three metrics and regardless of the missing miss rate. Uh, next slide. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope to see you at the poster session. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, the next talk. Hello, um, I'm Shweta, and I'll be presenting our work on supervised discriminative embedding for subaction learning in complex activities. This work is in collaboration with Dr. Hilde, Dr. Yogesh Asrawat, and Professor Mubaraksha. Next slide, please. So first, let's look at a complex activity. So a complex activity can be treated as a composed of a sequence of subactions, where here we show a sample activity mix details with the subactions outlined below. There can be variations in the ordering of subactions along with the variation in duration of the subactions based on the person performing the task. Next slide, please. So the problem we are interested in solving is to temporarily detect and segment the subactions for a complex activity. For example, we show images here uh, taken out from a complex activity video and the bar plot represents the duration of the video. The goal is to temporarily detect and segment the subactions as shown. Next, please. So prior works in this area mostly tackle in a two-stage approach, where in stage one, they learn an embedding, and then in stage two, they perform an explicit clustering step on the em learned embedding. So by making the clustering step independent of the embedding learning, the overall process becomes suboptimal. We try to address these aspects in our work and come up with the following contributions. Next, please. So first, we propose an unsupervised end-to-end -end approach that simultaneously incorporates both visual and temporal information. And then for better spatial representation, spatial temporal representation, we propose to use temporal position encoding vectors inspired by the transformers. And then we propose a novel discriminative latent concept learning module with the help of contrastive laws. We integrate clustering as part of embedding learning. Next, please. So coming to the notations, given uh, n videos for a complex activity where each video has mn features, we represent XNM as the mth feature in the nth video and its corresponding positional encoding is represented as rho nm. The goal is to predict the subaction label for each feature XNM for each video. Next, please. So here's the model overview. So given input videos, we are first passing through I3D and positional encoding branch to compute visual and temporal vectors. And then the visual features are passed through encoder to be later fused with the rho nm with the help of NFC to generate phi nm representation. And then we learn the latent concept y hat with the help of an MLP that takes in randomly initialized latent vectors as shown in the block A. And for each input phi nm with the help of y hat and attention block, we compute a representation z nm in the latent space shown as block B 
with the help of contrastive loss that brings similar latent clips to assign to one latent concept by pushing a far away irrelevant latent concepts from the latent uh, from the latent representation znm we again decompose it into visual and temporal representation and we regenerate the visual representation by passing it through a decoder with skip connection and then apply a reconstruction loss on both visual and temporal representation to train the encoder decoder model next please so here's the overall pipeline so given input videos we learn the latent concepts the latent concepts can be assigned to like one of the semantic subactions in the video here we show like the outline legend where each latent concept assigned to one subaction and we can generate initial prediction based on the clip to latent uh, subaction assignment and then we use witterbee to refine the initial prediction to generate the final prediction next please so to to show how we perform the witterbee decoding once from the latent embedding we define a transition modeling that defines the state transitions from each latent concept to the next latent concept based on the mean time of all the clips that get assigned to each of the latent concepts and using this both transition modeling and initial predictions we use witterbee to generate the final predictions next please so coming to results we show our results on three benchmark data sets next please first we show it on breakfast data set So here we compare our method with weakly supervised and unsupervised state of the art, and we show that our method outperforms on uh, the unsupervised state of the art. Additionally, we evaluate our method for the task of unsupervised event segmentation, where the goal is to identify the subaction boundaries within an event, and we report our method outperforms the state of the art even for the task of unsupervised event segmentation. Next, please. next we show our results on 50 sales data set and we again compare our results with state of the art on both tasks showing that our method outperforms uh, state of the art indicating the robustness of our approach to learning representations for latent activities next please and at the end we show our results on youtube instructions data set this data set has more general activities compared to more kitchen set act kitchen setting compared to the previous videos and again on this data set we show that our method of uh, outperform state of the art by 4% accuracy on the subaction learning and 5% accuracy on the event segmentation task indicating it is it works even in a general setting that is not restricted to the cooking setting next please so here are some qualitative results so here we compare our model performance with the baseline embedding so the ct in it and r in it shows the uh, predictions from the embedding it can be seen that baseline of the baseline uh, performance suffers from heavy jittering and there are many intermittent transitions happening while in our work we show that it it performs better grouping and there are very less intermittent which then we later refine with witterbee thank you great thank you um and then see the next presentation hi can i take it forward yes yeah so uh i'm a prashant pat so i'm actually presenting our paper distill on the go online knowledge translation in self supervised learning uh next slide please yeah so here i actually i introduce a uh, different uh, leading ssl methods so we that can actually divide into two kinds one is generative methods other one is contrastive methods So in our work, we focus on the context, context contrast methods such as the SimCLR, momentum contrast, and so on. So on the right, you see the SimCLR uh, technique. Actually, so in this one, so it uses so as Colin was pointing out, it is heavily dependent on different augmentations. It uses two different kinds of stochastic augmentations to generate positive pairs, and all other images in the batch are treated as a negative pairs. So idea is to actually trying to maximize the agreement between the positive pairs uh, simultaneously pushing away the negative pairs. Uh, next slide, please. So so there is actually so this is the problem statement for our paper. So what we're trying to address here that when we train the smaller models using SSL, the represent the representation quality is not as good as the supervised learning. So on the right you see a graph. So when we compare this. Uh, supervised learning image net top one accuracy against ssl with linear evaluation protocol as you can see for the smaller models the gap is pretty huge it's almost 50% while for the bigger models from resnet 50 and so on the gap is not so much so in this work with the help of knowledge legislation we try to actually address the problem of representation quality in smaller models next slide please 
So here is our proposed method. So we actually employ a contrasted learning baseline, SimCLR, as our uh, base network. Then we use two models in our uh, learning paradigm. So uh, as you can see, with the help of knowledge distillation, we try to align the softmax probabilities of the similarities scores across augmentations across two models, right? So in the end, what, what essentially happens is that, as you can see in the latent space, so the way it learns representations is different for each models. So we try to align the representations for both of them. So in the end, it is actually able to learn from the other peers. So that's where the extra information comes from in the end. Next slide, please. So here we present uh, our performance metrics. So what we use linear evaluation protocol, which is normally used in all uh, SSL uh, methods. And we also use uh, make use of this nearest neighbor evaluation using this FICE GPU from Facebook. So across uh, both the evaluation metrics, you can see that our method uh, outperforms the contrast learning baseline by a huge margin actually. This is for Resonant 18, and we also have a detailed result in our paper where we cover wider Resonant family also. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the performance evaluation on the out of distribution data. So we try to cover actually, so we train on the tiny image net and then we try to evaluate the performance on all different distributed, uh, sorry, all, all different data sets which have a quite different distribution compared to our uh, training data set. So as you can see, our method do go actually outperforms all across all data sets. So by a huge margin, actually, in some cases, it's, it's almost like four to 5%. In other cases, it's almost like 3%. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, in line with the objective of this uh, workshop, we also evaluate our method in uh, in a setting where we have a varied amount of label quantities. For example, we are given with the label quantities from 1%, 5%, 10, 20, and 50, and 100%. And we uh, train the model in an SSL manner in unlabeled, on an unlabeled data set. And then we fine tune the model using different quantities of the labels. As you can see, our method actually uh, is doing much better even given uh, very few labels uh, to all the labels. So across all different scenarios, our model performs the best. Uh, next slide, please. And also this is uh, also one of the objectives of the workshop. So where we evaluate our uh, model uh, in the presence of the noisy labels. So we simulate the noisy labels uh, on CIFAR 10 using different noise rates uh, from 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and 0 0.6. Uh, we again fine tune our network after SSL pre-training. So we can see that compared to the SimCLR, which is a contrast learning baseline, our method actually outperforms it across all different noise rates. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in the paper, what we propose, so we actually try to address the represent representation quality of the smaller models when they are pre-trained using uh, self-supervised learning. So with our method, the performance can be uh, much better than the contrast learning baseline. The performance can even be boosted further if we actually train with uh, more than two models. So at the moment, we're only using two models under our learning paradigm. If you use more, a cohort of models, let's say a few or five, six, seven models, then the improvement can be uh, much more. And we also, in the paper, we actually presented uh, different analysis under, let's say, varying degrees of label noise and also different levels of annotations uh, of the data availability. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. So I look forward to meeting you all at the post presentation later in the day. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, in the last talk. Hope, can you hear me? Yeah. If you can keep okay. it maybe to uh, five to seven minutes, uh, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Hello to everyone. My name is Giuseppe Pastore from Polytech Unit Torino. And I'm going to present the paper across the look at self training for zero labels multi segmentation. Next, please. Okay, our paper address uh, the semantic segmentation in the generalized zero label scenario. The world is divided into unseen and unseen classes. The seen classes are the ones that are notating during the training, while the unseen classes are the known classes that the model never seen at training time. The goal is in zero, in zero label assumption is to segment the unseen classes at this time, while in the generalized zero label scenario is to segment both seen and unseen classes. Please notice the difference with zero shot assumption, because in the zero shot, it assumes that no pixel of unseen classes uh, uh, is never seen by the model training time. While uh, in the zero label assumption, the training set includes many pixel of unseen classes, but unlabeled. Next, please. 
to the best of our knowledge, only two works directly address the generalized zero label semantic segmentation, but with complex structures and mechanisms to solve the common class imbalancing issues. Espinette takes us the task as a visual semantic embedding, trying to solve the problem of class imbalance through a calibration classifier that is uh, a calibration classifier that is driven by a hyperparameter that is hard to tune. While uh, ZS3 and Cagnet address the task through a more complex mechanism that is based on a feature generative approach. Next, please. As we saw in zero label assumption, a label pixel of training images can contain complementary information about unseen classes, but these are commonly ignored during the training. Next, please. What we propose uh, instead in this work is to capture the level information about unseen classes by supervising the model with self produced pseudo labels for the label pixels. However, I, how we will see in a moment, generating accurate pseudo labels for unseen classes semantic segmentation is uh, very hard because the accuracy of the model on unseen classes is often much lower than in the supervised case. So, next slide. Please. Our pipeline will work uh, like this. A step T, uh, an image X and its ground truth is given to a pseudo label generator. The pseudo label generator um, is entrusted to produce the pseudo label for the unseen classes on all label pixels. Then the pseudo label are combined with a label uh, with a label and to and it's obtained a new ground truth on which to fine-tune the model. The model is fine-tuned by computer computing both the cross-entropy on the seen classes for the label pixel and on the unseen classes for the pseudo-labels ones. Lastly, the pseudo-label generator is iteratively updated. So the fine-tuned model as step T is then used in the pseudo-label generator as step T plus one. Next slide, please. As said before, uh, generated hard pseudo labels as one of prediction directly from the predicted model is not ideal because of the high level of noise in the pseudo labeling step. Next slide. So, the key assumption of our method is that a pseudo label is more likely to be correct if the model predicts the same label when presented different augmented version of the same image. We call this approach consistent constraints and it consists in filtering out the pseudo label that are incons inconsistent across multiple augmented versions of the image. Next slide, please. We performed the experiment on Pascal VOC 12 and CogoStuff datasets, and we demonstrated that generally self training uh, strategies improve the performance on all the methods and for all the metrics, like it's possible to see for ZDS5 with respect to ZDS3 or SPNet plus ST with respect to SPNet. And also that our strict strategy outperform every published result by a good margin. Next slide. This is uh, true also when the background class is included in the search space for Pascal VOC 12 data set as seen class. Generally, the background is ignored during the training, but we um, perform ex uh, extra experiments that is reported in these slides. Next slide. In the ablation study uh, conducted on Pascal VOC 12, we found that performance tended to increase as the number of self training iteration does. Then they started to decreasing because of the fact that we do not have ground truth for the unseen classes pixel and noisy prediction can be only reduced by our approach, but not entirely eliminated. Regarding the transformation, we focus on two kinds of transformation, mirroring and the three variants of multi-scaling, upscaling, downscaling, and random scaling, and because we want them to be simple and invertible to keep the pixel matching among the various transformation. And according to the result shown in the tables, we found that the combination of mirroring and upscaling is the best one for our final model. Next slide, please. So concluding among the main findings of this work, there are that strict is a simple, robust, and high scalable self-training pipeline based only on consistency constraints and iterate the fine tuning rather than on a more complex parameter based on other parameters. And this sense, uh, this uh, allow strict to be the current state of the art on generalized zero-label semantic segmentation. 
On the contrary, some drawbacks are also present, like the dependency on the number of concurrent pixels of the classes in the dataset and the fact that the pseudo labels noise can be reduced but not entirely eliminated. And this requires further works in this uh, direction. So, these slides conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Next slide. The, here's this is the code, the QR code for my for the Slick GitHub page and my mail. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the good news is that we're caught up relatively in time, uh, only three minutes behind. The bad news is we can't take questions for the orals, um, but you can uh, join their Gatherly poster session, uh, which is uh, around noon uh, Pacific time. 3 p.m. Eastern. So um, I guess, Noel, do you want to kick off the next session? Sure. Um, so yeah, so this will be the, uh, the few shot on learning session. And we have a number of speakers um, with us today. Um, so maybe we'll go through a round of uh, introductions and then we'll uh, begin with uh, some of the questions. Um, so uh, uh, Chelsea, you, you want to start us off? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford. Uh, I actually work a lot on robotics and machine learning, but um, one of the things that we might want a robot to do is to be able to learn from a small amount of data, um, for example, learning a new task. And so on the machine learning side and on the computer vision side, I've also studied learning from small amounts of data, especially small amounts of online data, both in supervised learning settings as well as in reinforcement learning settings. Awesome. Rogerio, would you like to go next? Yes, uh, I'm Rogerio Ferris. I'm a principal scientist and research manager at the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. And I've been working with uh, learning with limited uh, label data, especially transfer learning and, and two-shot learning. Awesome. Um, so I think that Trevor was not able to be with us today, but we have a number of, uh, 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 of his colleagues in here. So um, I think uh, Amir, you're here in Colorado. Would you like guys what, like to introduce yourselves? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Amir. I'm a PhD student in uh, Tel Aviv University, and right now a visiting student in uh, Berkeley AI Research in Trevor's lab. And I'm mostly working on self-supervised learning and video understanding. Uh, yeah, that's mostly about me. Great, and I'm Colorado Reed. I'm a PhD student at Berkeley, and I'm one of Trevor's students. I work on a lot of fundamental vision questions that have to do with learning with fewer labels. Awesome. And then we have a couple of accepted uh, oral talks um, in the session as well. Um, do we have representatives from each of those papers? We have rectified metric propagation for few shot learning. Is Yang uh, here or someone else from that paper? Yeah, Yang's here, I'm Yang. Hi Yang, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, I'm a PhD candidate from University of Buffalo and my current research mainly focused on generative modeling and uh, basic learning. That's most about me. Thank you. Awesome. And then we also have shot in the dark, a few shot learning with no base class labels. Um, do we have a Zetian here? Or someone else from that paper? No? OK. Um, so I think uh, we have a lot of participants um, at this uh, session, so maybe the best way to do the questions is as we were doing it previously, which is, you know, if you could post um, the question uh, in the chat, um, and then we will uh, read it off to the speakers and uh, get you uh, answers. I think that might be the easiest uh, way to, to do this. Um, Maybe we'll start off uh, with a question uh, for, for Chelsea. Um, so, um, you know, I actually had a question. So I thought that that was an awesome application that you presented for a few shot learning um, and with uh, very impressive results, right? Um, so I was wondering if you've studied whether or not the approach can generalize across uh, different subject areas of, of education um, and whether, and you know, if you have, what kind of results are you seeing and uh, what type of challenges might you foresee um, in, in other uh, educational domains, or do you think it's going to be very easy transition to other, other domains? Yeah, so I guess um, for reference, in case anyone didn't see the talk, I talked about how we can look at few-shot learning in an education domain, where our goal is to give feedback to students. Uh, and 
this can be framed as a few shot learning problem because instructors always all the time are changing the um, kinds of assignments that they put out to students. And so you have maybe a repository of a lot of previous different assignments and exams and so forth that has potentially labeled data. And now you're kind of have a new assignment um, and you wanna be able to give feedback to students efficiently. And it's of course, super time consuming to give feedback, um, especially on Python programming code, open-ended solutions, which is what we were looking at. Um, and so ideally, if an instructor can give feedback on say like 10 of these examples and then the system can give feedback on the rest, that would be a huge win for education. Uh, and we, we showed some uh, surprise, surprising to us results that were, were quite positive. Um, and so, so far we've only looked at Python programming um, where we're giving feedback on these Python programs. And it's actually in many ways a, a setting that makes a lot of sense because first it's like really time consuming and hard for instructors to debug students code uh, while giving feedback. And also instructors actually aren't very good at it. The like um, the average like agreement or success rate among instruct instructors is um, in the like 80% like 85% range, um, so lower than you might expect. Um, and we haven't yet started looking into kind of broadening the subject areas that we are looking at, but we actually uh, just signed a collaboration agreement with Gradescope um, so that we can actually start looking at that problem and um, getting data from, from more than one subject area. So far we were just working with the data set from the intro CS course at Stanford. I guess maybe another part of that question is what challenges might arise. And I think that all sorts of challenges will arise um, when we move to that setting. It'll just be a much broader distribution that you have to figure out how to fit. And you may also have multimodal data. We've been looking at purely Python code so far and applying transformers to that. But you might have images, you might have um, text, you might have um, all sorts of things. And uh, developing a model that can handle that and can understand such a broad distribution, I think, is going to be challenging. Also, once we move from like a single narrow course to like all of grade scope, um, instructors will have different ways that they use rubrics and different ways that they specify questions and so forth. And that's gonna mean the data is a lot noisier and just generally harder to fit. Cool, yeah, thank you. Um, so maybe uh, we, next question for uh, uh, Rogerio. Um, so I really thought that that was a very fantastic talk and very interesting insights that came from that in terms of how different pre-training objective functions can affect the transferability of, of the models. Um, so in, 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 in your work, you guys focused on uh, ResNet 50, as I, I think it was, in terms of the architecture. So I was wondering um, if you could uh, comment or, or speculate as to the implications of the findings in your work um, and how those uh, might uh, translate to situations where people are trying to transfer from very large models or very large models trained on very large data sets. Because we see a lot of new works with, you know, these gigantic models transferring to various uh, situations. So I was wondering if you could comment on that context. Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Noel. Um, so yeah, so, so there are two aspects here, right? So one, one is scaling, um, you know, larger data uh, and bigger models. And, and the other one is the choice of the backbone uh, itself, uh, like vision transformers versus uh, ResNet, right? Uh, let me try to, to you know, comment on, on both aspects. So re regarding scaling, uh, we, we did not uh, you know, scale up, uh, we, we did scale down. So we, we did test with um, ImageNet 100, uh, so less classes and, and less data. And uh, the conclusions uh, were quite similar to what we uh, reported, um, you know, meaning that uh, contrastive representations, they, they transfer better, especially when you have, um, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, difference in terms of uh, domains. Um, so if we scale up, I, I think that this, this is a very interesting direction that we have not uh, explored. Um, and especially, you know, if we consider you know, a lot of data like the JFT data set and the uh, you know, VAT G14 uh, uh, model. Um, you know, for us, we, we don't have, you know, available, you know, to, to use the JFT data set and, and also, you know, doing all the experiments that we did uh, in such a large scale would involve a lot of computation, right? Uh, but, but I do think it would be interesting to see, you know, whether this conclusion, um, you know, holds 
with, um, you know, like com comparing a cross entropy model with, um, you know, a, a contrastive model. My, my guess is that um, when you go, you know, with such large uh, data, especially with weekly supervised data, like, like GFT, you know, it's not uh, fully supervised, but weekly supervised, I guess cross entropy models could be less specialized and, 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 and the gap uh, could decrease, uh, but, but it's still, uh, we would need to see and it would be a good test. Um, re regarding the, the choice of the backbone, so as you said, we, we did our study uh, with ResNet uh, models. Uh, we, we did not test uh, DIT. We did test uh, a, a wide ResNet, so, so a large uh, backbone, and uh, we got similar uh, results. So I think if we switch, for example, you know, with DIT, of course, if you compare DIT with CNNs, they, they have different properties, right? People have shown that, uh, you know, vision transformers, they, they capture more shape and, and texture and so on, and they might generalize better. Um, but uh, I think if you compare within the same model, like taking DIT and comparing all these different uh, losses, um, you know, it could be possible that our conclusions um, you know, would hold. This is an empirical study, right? So it's a little bit hard to uh, extrapolate, but but I, I do think you know this would be a very interesting direction to try. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Um, cool. I can ask one as well. Sure. Um, okay, so I guess yeah, we can even it out a little. Uh, this is uh, for Trevor's group. Um, so this is actually a YouTube comment um, asking. I have a question about unsupervised pre-training for object detection works, uh, both ResSim and and Detreg. Uh, I'm wondering whether these two methods are generic to different detector architectures. If not, is it possible to have a unified self-supervised object detection method, which is generic to any kind of detector, detector architecture? What are the fundamental or key properties of this kind of method? I can, I can take a swing of that first, Amir. That works, sure. So sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. The work with ReSIM, for example, was looking at spatial consistency in the features across the convolutional feature maps, right? So that is specific to a ComNet. Um, but the idea of spatially consistent features should extend beyond a ComNet. For example, if we're looking at transformer architectures and we have patch level consistency, which could reflect spatial consistency, that should be present as well. So the general concepts that we're finding working maybe with a particular architecture should generalize uh, beyond the architecture whenever that idea is present. And of course, things like uh, location sensitive or locality is an important concept in computer vision and, and has spanned well before the era of uh, just deep networks, right? And it worked well then, and we had lots of techniques to do that then. And so I think that's a really cool research question of like, how can we keep reintroducing and reapplying these same concepts as we have new architectures with slightly different implementation differences. But the core underlying ideas go back 20, 30, 40 years. And I think we're just reusing those and re-exploring them as, as we have new tools and new understandings. Um, so uh, yeah. Go, go, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, That's, yeah, so just, just uh, to, add, to add on top of what uh, Colorado said. Uh, so about Dietrich, the Dietrich paper, the other talk. So, so Dietrich is not exclusive to transformers and, and we chose to base it over uh, the deformable Dieter architecture and mainly because it was very fast to train in an academic bad budget. So you could train uh, the, the, the Dietrich pre-training stage in around one day and, and fine tune it over Coco for around two days. It was very practical for us in our uh, cheap academic setting. Um, but you could try the same concept. I mean, the main concept of Dietrich is let's try to do some detection in the pre-training stage. This concept is not exclusive to transformers. You can try to do it with any architecture. We did it just because it was very easy for us with the deformable DTR architecture. So that's one thing. And the, the other thing I want to add is that Dietrich is also complementary to uh, to ideas like uh, ReSIM that Colorado presented. So any improvement in backbones is just complementary and, and is probably gonna push the results uh, higher. Uh, yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. 
Yeah, we had a question for the uh, for the ReSIM uh, approach. So um, I thought it was a very interesting uh, kind of a, a approach to um, expand the objective function through the layers of the network and impose uh, some consistency between uh, the same regions of the image across different uh, deformations. Um, my question was, uh, in, in the work, you, you, you specified that, that the regions are spatially essentially exactly the same, except that they're um, uh, they go through different types of deformations, but the uh, the regions themselves are also going through the deformation, sort of, or, or the ROIs, let me say. Um, so my question was whether or not you had studied um, introducing any amount of like jitter or noise to those regions, so that you still have essentially the same region, but there's a little bit of um, of perturbation there, and whether or not um, that additional um, kind of uh, noise uh, changed the the performance of the model at all. And, and that would be like a robustness kind of study. Yeah. Study. I think that's that's definitely one that we want to add in. We didn't add that in the paper in the, in the current version, but we have a couple of different robustness studies. And I think part of that is, is looking at those local uh, patch level features, those, those you know regional features and saying, well, how well do these actually keep matching as we introduce you know more, more variances or invariances and, and noise and those types of questions. So I think that's a really crucial question. And also ties back to people who, um, you know, in some of these original local feature analysis type works where we do, uh, you know, like image stitching or correspondence learning, you know, those types of questions and there's data sets that do exactly that. And I think actually those robustness and analyses of the underlying spatial features is missing from a lot of current self-supervised work, my own included, our own included, right? But I, I'd be really excited to see that understanding and that connection with these sort of global and object level features tying back in with how robust they are at the local feature matching or region feature matching level. Right, right, right. Yeah, the comment was, uh, so it's both robustness, but also, also curious if that changed the performance of the model like to be better, right? If you have some additional amount of variation to the, to the, to, to the regions, but that's, that's very interesting. That was very uh, cool work. Um, yeah, just to, uh, sorry, really quick. We, we are uh, following up on this work uh, kind of in that direction of understanding what the local features are doing. And so I, I absolutely agree with that comment. It's a great comment. Awesome, yeah, cool. Um, and the next question was for on target uh, adaptation. Um, so for the target data, you guys started with a scratch model for um, you know, doing the contrastive learning and then did a, uh, an ablation study to study each, each component. Um, I was just curious if you also had examined um, using various types of pre-trained models to start with um, at that stage. So don't start from scratch, but start from something else and how that affected the performance of the, of the system. Uh, that's a great question. That was actually Deshwan's work. Uh, and that is neither Amir nor myself. So unfortunately, I'm not sure if he tried that, um, but I but I know he has worked a lot with various pre-trained model explorations. Right, okay, cool. I, I can ask one as well. Um, so this one is, I guess, for Chelsea, but um, I think actually others can answer as well. Um, so maybe we can go around. Um, so, I've, you know, in your, in your presentation, you showed a, a specific real world use case. Um, I was wondering, did you, uh, you, I noticed you were using kind of prototypical type methods, um, but I was wondering if you tried other ones and if you noticed kind of which methods were better than others in real world cases and if that aligned with kind of the literature um, on more academic data sets. Yeah, that's a great question. We actually didn't try other methods. Um, my intuition was that prototypical networks would be the best performing method in this particular application because I guess for a number of reasons. Um, I first, the student solutions are somewhat long tailed and people have found that prototypical networks can handle long tail distributions uh, a bit better than um, kind of standard supervised learning methods. Um, we also ended up needing to scale up to pretty large transformer models that were pre-trained with uh, models uh, self-supervisedly trained on, on code, on Python code. And I think that applying a bi-level optimization, for example, would be pretty difficult to do to those kinds of models, although people in the NLP literature have shown some success there. Uh, and it's also like, it's like prototypical networks are generally very fast to train because they're fully feed forward and so forth. Um, and then compared to more like black box meta-learning methods, um, I think that in the classification domain, 
um, those aren't very competitive with things like prototypical networks and mammal. And so we, we didn't even consider trying those. I see. Okay. And yeah, I know, Rogerio, obviously, uh, you have a lot of experience applying these methods to kind of real world problems. I don't know if you had something to chime in there. Yeah, I think um, um, uh, so it's one, one thing that, uh, so, so our, our study uh, is actually just based on, on MOCO v2, right? So we, we, we took that, uh, you know, method as representative, you know, for, uh, you know, contrastive learning. Um, but but one, one thing that we, we want to do, you know, is to expand uh, this analysis, you know, to other, um, you know, self-supervised and contrastive methods like Sinclair and Viol and, 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 and so many others uh, out there, right? And uh, Timothy uh, Hospedales actually has one interesting paper where he compares, uh, you know, different uh, self-supervised contrastive uh, methods and, and uh, transfer analysis. Um, with some of the experiments related to ours and some of the conclusions uh, similar uh, as well. As for real world applications, um, uh, we, we, we did try to, you know, get, um, you know, data sets like, uh, you know, for medical imaging and, and satellite imagery. Um, and uh, we, we are actually very excited about, you know, moving towards those applications, which are very different uh, from ImageNet. Um, and at the same time, they have a lot of, you know, real world um, value. Okay, great. Noel, did you want to ask something? Yeah, sure. Um, I think our next question is for uh, Yang. Um, so uh, a couple of questions uh, uh, came in. So first of all, that was a very interesting method with uh, very impressive results. So, so thanks a lot for, for presenting your work. Um, I was curious if you've studied uh, varying the value of the mixing uh, weight alpha and, and how that um, uh, changed results. I think in your presentation you showed um, 0.1 um, between the two um, objectives, but uh, wondering if you could comment briefly on how changing that parameter um, changes the performance of the system. Sure, sure, no problem. Because we use the alpha value to balance the global matching loss and the local matching loss. In terms of the global machine loss, we are matching the uh, feature to the global prototype. And in terms of local machine loss, we are matching the feature to the local pro prototype feature. So we initialized from, uh, uh, so in our ablation experiment, we start from alpha that is zero. And we find that the global matching in itself, we cause inconsistent, inconsistent, consistent issues as alpha gets a bit larger global and the local prototypes try to reach a consensus to induce a ultimate model. But while alpha is a very large, instability issues will be triggered where global and local prototypes struggle with each other. And I think uh, we put a figure in our paper. So let's answer for this comment. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks. Um, the next question um, also for you um, is uh, whether or not uh, you did any type of evaluation of your approach in a cross-domain uh, few shot setting and um, what kind of um, uh, performance you saw in, under those conditions. Okay, so uh, frankly, I'm not a, a expert in few shot learning, but I'm not sure what kind of cross-domain experiments. And so we didn't include a, this kind of experiment in our paper. Okay, thank you. And um, did anyone from Shot in the Dark um, join the uh, Q&A session? Do we have a Zetian or someone else from that paper here? Um, well, I have a kind of like a more uh, high level question that maybe we can kind of turn this almost, almost into a panel session and kind of like have a big picture discussion about where the field is going. Um, but we see a number of works coming out now where, you know, like, for example, the open AI contrastive learning a clip paper, or um, we see some uh, models that are trained on very, very large and diverse data sets. And um, from this, we see you know, very impressive performance for situations like zero shot uh, recognition or uh, low shot um, uh, uh, recognition. I was wondering if we could um, kind of have a discussion about where these works are 
kind of taking the few shot learning field and where we see the remaining challenges as being and um, you know where we think the important um, you know some important work still needs to be uh, had to be done um, moving forward. Um, I mean, some of my own comments are like, you know, looking at the, uh, at the clip paper, it's, it's clear that when they, when they evaluated the work on a variety of different domains, um, some domains that got further away from, even though their training set is very diverse, right, some domains that got further and further away from heavy representation in that, in that, in that diversity um, kind of uh, decreased in performance. Um, so it seems that there's clearly still some uh, cross domain challenges happening. Um, but you know, there may still be questions over, well, how do you determine whether or not a um, data set is actually within domain or not, right? I actually don't think that that's a, um, a, a, a trivial question, right? Um, and also, you know, what do we do in situations where we have um, you know, small compute and we can't fit these really big models? So. I'll just pose that kind of like high level question. I'd just love to get people to like have a discussion around this. Um, so anyone from the, from the panel uh, would like to take the mic and carry this forward, please. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can uh, start. Um, I, I, I do think uh, that, you know, the direction that uh, few shot um, uh, learning and classification, especially in, in computer vision, um, you know, we, we are moving, you know, towards really getting a good embedding um, and, um, you know, getting a good embedding, like using, you know, big models and, um, you know, big data, um, it, it seems to, you know, be, be improving results, right? E even using big models with, you know, training for less iterations, you compare with um, using smaller models with more iterations and, and, and so on. Um, I, I do think uh, as you, Pointed out, uh, that there is still a gap. Um, like I, I don't think we are close to a general purpose universal pre-training model that can transfer to all different kinds of applications, and especially those that are, you know, uh, very different from ImageNet, uh, not related to natural images. Um, I think, um, you know, most works on on self-supervised learning they, they deal with curated data sets, and I think considering you know, um, images from very different domains um, um, and uncurated data, data sets, you know, it, it's an important uh, direction. I, I, I do think, uh, and I was, you know, hearing the, the comments from Senia in, in the last uh, panel, I, I, I do believe also in, in, in synthetic data, um, you know, how, how we can better pre-train models or, or even generate, you know, more data from, from different domains. Um, and, uh, you know, some architectures like the, the vision transformers, you know, if you take like the self-attention layers, they are self-similarity, right? And they could possibly generalize, you know, to data that is, um, you know, unreal, right? Um, so, yeah, I think those, those are my comments. I can also comment. Um, I guess first, I think that, that those works are really impressive and, and really exciting, uh, the results that they're able to show. Um, and of course, I think that there's still also a lot of work to be done as well. Um, I think that one of my perspectives on those works is that it shows that if we can collect a very broad distribution of data, then we can do a lot. Uh, and in some ways, I think that kind of the next frontier of machine learning in many ways is to be able to not just fit a distribution, but to at least somewhat go beyond that distribution to some degree and handle distribution shift, handle domain shift. Um, and so I think that that's like one, at least in my mind, kind of big grand challenge that we need to think about. Um, and some of that may be on the data side as well. Some of it may be on, um, <clears throat> or, or some of it may be more on the algorithm side. Um, and then my, <clears throat> my other perspective is that there are a lot of real world problems where you don't have tons of data on the internet and you need to think about, um, you need to be able to handle those settings like medical imaging, the education example that I mentioned, um, robotics is also an example like that. And so you need to think about um, methods that, that don't operate in a way that requires all that data. And, and things like transfer learning could still be beneficial where you pre-train on that. Um, it could also be a matter of uh, building data sets that, or building methods that don't need um, kind of massive amounts of data to train.
I could uh, I could add in just briefly. I think I agree very much with Chelsea and, and Rogero uh, with with their perspectives. Uh, and a lot of this work is really relying on curated data sets. And to some degree, you know, we know behind the scenes that uh, when we've we've been there, there's this sort of test set hacking that happens a lot, where you know you try things out, you try augmentations. And you can even be explicit about it in papers. Nothing nefarious necessarily, but um, we we really overfit to the benchmarks that we have. And so as we start to look at satellite images or medical images or these things that are maybe different than the distributions we worked with, we find that it starts to break down. And so as we move, I think, to looking at working with more uncurated data that spans a lot of different domains, there's these meta level questions and these learning the augmentations or learning the invariances that we care about from the data itself that starts to become crucial to these working outside of that very specific benchmarks in which maybe the paper was written. So to me, that's really exciting. And I think we see a lot of papers that come out and focus on kind of new benchmarks, but that work that looks at a wide range of domains and this, this approach of trying to learn from the data, those things that we previously just, you know, run the test over and over to find out, uh, that's, that's really exciting for me. And I think that leads to more of the broad application. Yeah, and I completely agree with that as well. And one thing that I'll add there actually is that if you take an off the shelf object detector um, trained on a super broad distribution and deploy it on a robot, it just like doesn't work at all. Um, and the, the things that fail are first, robots don't take pictures like people take pictures. Uh, people kind of center things and it's a very nice distribution. Robots might be closer to the ground. They might, it might just be a different perspective that wouldn't be like something a, a person that would take a picture of and put it on the internet. Um, and then second, the kinds of objects in the world is just vast. And so whatever a thousand classes you have in your data set, maybe more than that, um, it just doesn't cover the kinds of objects that robots will see on a regular basis. I also yeah. want to jump in and, uh, sorry. I also want to jump in and, and also second uh, Chelsea. And it seems like um, even models which are trained on practically infinite amount of data like, like CLIP or DALI, they seem to, to be limited uh, in different ways. Like for example, uh, causality or spatial understanding. Like if you ask a model like DALI that synthesizes images to plot an image of few objects, one right to the other and stuff like that, you see very amusing failure cases. It seems like it's possible that some of the current models are missing different structures within the models and uh, uh, maybe coming up with this kind of structures could lead to you know improved models that can make better you know sample efficiency during training etc cetera, etc cetera. so i guess yeah. um one positive kind of aspect you know on chelsea's presentation i mean the the, the results seem pretty good right you compare it to humans and i know there's like caveats of course in terms of sample size and things like that but i guess there's a question of are, are these like few shot methods especially good enough to be able to deploy these like to a real world? I, I mean, I, I was glad to hear you're, you're trying it on grade scope level things, um, but are, are they good enough to deploy at this point or are there still like challenges or limitations? Yeah, so one thing I mentioned actually at the very end of my talk is we did actually deploy it in a real live application, um, this online course called Code in Place and um, one thing that we did see that was that there was actually some distribution shift between kind of Stanford solutions and this online course. And so we did actually end up fine tuning the model on um, the few shot model on, um, I think we ended up getting around a thousand labeled examples um, from that test, ex test domain. Um, and we weren't really planning to, to do that originally, but we also actually had the data because um, we just asked a bunch of few, like volunteer instructors to um, to help label it, and that's what they gave us. Um, and they weren't able to grade the other fifteen thousand solutions, of course, um, and so that was what we deployed the model on. Um, so I think that from that, I mean, it's really hard to extrapolate to any real world use case, of course, but it's an example of actually being able to successfully deploy um, deploy this in a real setting with real students and so forth. And, and we were really excited about the results. Um, yeah, and and of course. Uh, the next frontier would be moving to things like grade scope. Just a follow-up question, uh, Chelsea. Uh, I, I really like the, the application that, that you described. Um, 
you, you, you mentioned that uh, multimodal information like using images could potentially help. And, and I, I was wondering if you have comments on, on how um, you know, that, that would help. Yeah, so first, um, in some ways, it's the, the problem is already sort of multimodal because we're using text in the form of the question and the rubric, the, like the, the text that the instructor put in for the rubric and the question, as well as Python code, which is the student solution. Um, and we're using, we're basically passing both that information into a transformer. Um, with regard to multimodal with images, I'm imagining that that might be something that comes up when looking at grade scope data, because when you, um, when someone actually like draws, like people, there might be some things where a student needs to draw like a graphical model or something, or needs to, to draw something to indicate their understanding. And so some of the solutions will have images, some of the solutions will be text, some of the solutions will be code. And um, I think that it'd be quite exciting if you could basically train a model on all of that and have it do better than if you like only kind of curated your data set to have one of the modalities. And in principle, it seems like uh, all of that data should be should be useful. Cool. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess we can, I don't know if we have time for another question. We have two minutes. Um, Noel, did you want to ask a quick question or? Yeah, I've got a quick question. So um, Chelsea, in your, in your work, um, one of the things I thought that was very interesting about it is that you could really kind of like narrowly uh, identify in what way um, a student might be um, ha having a problem on a particular question. And that can actually give a lot of insight over time, right? So you can see, is this, is this student having challenges in certain facets of the of, of, of lesson plan or the study? And you can kind of like almost get, get a distribution over the entire student population, who, who is having difficulties where, right? And that lends itself to, um, you know, the possibility of having much more um, uh, targeted uh, lesson, pl lesson planning, right? Where, you know, maybe a particular student could get um, more instruction in a particular uh, field of, of, of that, that they're having difficulty with, or be presented with more problem sets in that field to get more practice. Um, have you guys thought about that at all? Or um, this isn't really a few shot learning question, but uh, more like an impact uh, question. Yeah, so this is in general something that we're really excited about. And I've, I've been collaborating with um, Chris Peach, who's an assistant professor of CS education. And one of the reasons why he is like so excited about this work isn't just the potential for giving feedback, but the potential just for understanding students better. And if we can better understand students, there's probably a whole much, a whole lot more we can do. Um, and like first we could, um, instead of just applying this to their final solution, you could actually look at all of their intermediate solutions as they are like typing them and as they're editing their code to see how they're understanding things. And that's not something you could do at all if it was like a, a human, because you just don't have time to manually do that. Right. Um, and that might contribute to understanding. And you, if you can develop a better understanding of the student, then you might be able to help them much better. You might be able to, um, to kind of do like what you said with targeting the curriculum and so forth. So. Um, yeah, I think there's like a, kind of a whole world of, of opportunities in this space. Um, figuring out how to formulate the problem and how best to approach those problems. They're all like, um, they're all really interesting. They're all super challenging as well. You can't just formulate it as a supervised learning problem uh, in many instances, but uh, I, I think it's really exciting. And um, yeah, something we're hoping to do more of in the future. Um, the other thing I, I'd love to do at some point, but is also super hard, is try to figure out how we can get an open source data set uh, with these kinds of problems. Um, because of like student privacy rules and so forth, it's like extremely difficult to even consider approaching that. Um, but if we can get an open source data set, then it just makes it much more possible for people to, for like the whole community to look at this problem rather than just the people who, who have the data. Yeah, right, exactly. It'd be very exciting to have a, kind of like a challenge, uh, an education uh, challenge. Um, That'd be a very cool idea. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks a lot to our whole uh, panel of, uh, of speakers and, and submitted works. Um, you know, I think this has been a fantastic discussion, uh, fantastic talks. Um, so, yeah, look forward to interacting with all of you uh, uh, go, going forward. Yep. Thanks, everyone. And uh, again, I mean, all the 
obviously YouTube presentations are online and you can feel free to ask questions on the YouTube comments as well. Um, and I think there's always, we're, you know, uh, future directions questions. Um, I think we talked about some of them like outer distribution type data, um, but we'll, we'll for, for whoever is available, we'll, we'll talk about a lot of those uh, in the last panel as well. Um, so right now, um, yeah, th thanks for all the panelists. Uh, right now we're moving into a coffee break, um, after which we'll have uh, the third panel, which is on uh, robustness and adversarial um, learning and, and bias and fairness, um, which should be great. So um, we'll come back at 10.10 um, 10, uh, Pacific time and uh, one ten Eastern time. So I guess depending on what time zone, it's either a coffee break or a very quick lunch. Um, so we'll be back then. Thank you. <laughs>